It's Pyarm King. I'm super excited to bring to you another guide to Curse of Strahd. This is part two to the Amber Temple. This is the lower level, an epic location. We've got the Amber Vaults, the Amber Sarcophagi, the Dark Gifts with the Dark Vestiges in there. We've got a whole new location. DM Andy, the, the map designer for this, put a new location into us where the Red Gem is hidden if you're running that Fae Quest. And a big special treat for you because some of our Patreon supporters have submitted voice acting for each of the Dark Vestige. We're going to be listening to those here. Every Patreon member that submitted one, you're going to listen to at least one of your voices in here. Really excited about that. There were so many to choose from. I decided to put them all into an organized file, a zip file, make them available to all the Patreon members so you can go ahead and have the fun time like I did listening to them all, figuring out which ones you want to include in your game. So we're going to be sharing those with you. Super, super excited. Now, of course, there's the detailed PDF guide for this. There's the voice acting sound files. In addition, everything you see here is a Foundry adventure module you can download and install. It has links right back to D&D Beyond. If you're a Patreon supporter at the Foundry level, your names are actually credits right here. These are all the Patreon members that actually made this video guide, the Patreon module, everything happen. And if you're a Patreon supporter at the PDF level, your names are in the PDF guide, which is really awesome. So huge shout out. Thank you to all of you guys for making this happen. We have a great Discord community as well. Thank you to all those that participated in the voice acting for the Dark Vestiges. Really, really cool. Now, a couple of special acknowledgments. DM Andy again, he's made this gorgeous battle map we're going to be looking at here today. He created an extra chamber, a secret chamber. We're going to be getting into there through a puzzle door and a teleport to get that red gem to safety, to, to, to secure the mountain fey. It's part of that fey quest. Really excited about that. He's gracious enough to allow us to include a WebP version in our Foundry PDF guides. Big, big thank you to him. Now, if you want the gridded version or you want the 4K or 8K high resolution or the special versions of these, they're available on his Patreon webpage. There's a link down below to DM Andy's Patreon. Go check those out. Also, big shout out to Blair, the developer of Seam Packer module. Blair's making this all happen for you Foundry people out there. I mean, without Blair, Seam Packer module and his guidance, none of these modules would be made for Foundry. If you're interested in making your own Foundry adventures, share them with the community. Go check out Blair Seam Packer module. His Patreon and his support levels are down there. Blair and DM Andy are also on our Discord channel, always communicating, having a good time with uh, everybody and helping people out. Uh, and even if you're not a Patreon member, come and join us on Discord. We've, we're, we're chatting, we're sharing images and ideas, campaign stories, which I love reading those campaign stories, hearing all those different crazy things that are happening on in your campaigns. That's that's probably one of the best treats that I get is reading all of those things. I really enjoy hearing what's happening in other people's campaigns. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's jump into it. And as you know, uh, before I get into the details of these video guides, I like to give some backstory and, and, and some things about what's going on. It helps bring some context to the entire guide. So the first thing we're gonna cover here is we're gonna talk about the Amber Sarcophagi. There's a bunch of them here. Uh, and how they work, how the dark gifts work, so you understand the mechanics as we each, visit each one of these and also hear that cool voice acting. So let's talk about the dark gifts. So first of all, there's these amber sarcophagi. They're about eight feet tall, five feet wide, five feet thick. They're thick, thick amber. Inside the amber, there is a dark vestige. It's a, like a whiff, a sliver of like black smoke frozen in, uh, in there. Now these amber sarcophagi are, are prisons for these remnants of these dark gods uh, from another plane or from another plane of existence or a domain or something. We don't know exactly what they are, but they're sentient. They're completely immune to and, and can't be harmed, can't be controlled. They're immune to all conditions as long as they're in that amber sarcophagi. Now if you destroy one of those amber sarcophagi, they're, they're AC uh, 16, take hit 80 hit points, uh, they, that dark vestige escapes, and in, in 1d10 plus 10 days, it will manifest into its dark power and wreak havoc upon the land, or perhaps return to its plane, or maybe another domain of dread. Now, what's really cool about this is if you want to expand your campaign, maybe to another domain of dread or something going on else in Barovia, if one of those dark vestiges escapes and starts manifesting into its 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 godlike form or its evil power, or whatever, you can you can expand your own campaign by doing that. So this leaves it open to to really expand into another domain of dread. Something I've been thinking about quite a bit. 
actually how these things can expand your campaign. Now let's talk about the dark gift itself. How do you get the dark gift? How does this whole mechanic thing work? The first thing is, is a player has to physically touch the amber sarcophagi. When you touch the amber sarcophagi, you create a telekinetic link and you fall into this trance, this hallucinogenic trance in which you're now envisioning the full manifestation of that dark vestige, what it was like as a full powerful god in its natural plane of his existence or domain, wherever it's from. You're going to see it and you're going to hear it speak to you as you're touching and making this telepathic link to it by touching the amber sarcophagi. Now, it's going to speak to you, not a lot, just a few words, and in those few words are a clue to the dark gift it's going to grant to you, because it wants to remain, it wants to continue on forth, and it can, you know, live vicariously through you as it transforms you with some of its dark gifts. Now, you will not know, the players will not know what the dark gift is unless they accept it. They're gonna get a clue. There's a clue to what they're seeing, there's a clue to what's being said, but unless they accept the dark gift, they will not know what it is. Now, a player can refuse it, say, yeah, tr try to pull its hand away, break the, the, the connection, and refuse it. In order to refuse it, you must roll a wisdom save, and the DC is based on your alignment. So if you have an evil aligned character that's made this connection with a dark vestige in the amber, and it says, I don't want this, this gift, thank you, in order to break free and not get the gift, you need to roll a wisdom save DC 14. If you fail that, you're gonna get the dark gift. You don't get a choice. If it's a neutral aligned character, it's a DC 12. And if it's a good aligned character, it's a DC 10. Now, I wouldn't tell the players this. If they, they can learn something through it, or it's implied if they restore Kazan's memory. Kazan says it's very hard if you make a link with one of the dark dark vestiges in the amber, it's very hard to refuse the dark gift. And that's what, I'd leave it at that. And then the first player, they're gonna have to roll this wisdom DC. I would not tell them what the DC is. Keep the DC signed, so you need to roll a wisdom safe. You know, if they fail it, they accept the dark gift. Important note, from the, the ruins of Bargao in that guide, in that campaign, there is the undead cave bear that's been infused with amber dust. And if you remember in that encounter, if you kill that undead cave bear, it bursts and that amber dust goes everywhere. If a player is infused with the amber dust, they're going to be rolling disadvantage on those wisdom saves. They, are, they have this amber dust, which held uh, a dark vestige at some point, is infused in the player, and some of that is 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 giving that player the making it more difficult to refuse the dark power. The player has been infused with this dust. So remember that there's a note here: disadvantage on wisdom saves if one of those players from that session with that cave bear received any of that amber dust. So if you haven't checked out that guide, make sure to check out the ruins of Bai Gao. Follow up on that dead cave bear. All right. Now the dark gifts act like a charm. In fact, the majority of dark gifts, which we'll be revealing, are a spell. Now this spell operates like an action. Um, there, you don't need a spell slot, you don't need a magic user, you just get, this is your gift, it just operates like an action. You can use the dark gift. Every one of the dark gifts recharges after either a short or long rest, and some of them have a recharging feature that needs to be met in order for that dark gift to recharge. They'll be covered, each one of those will be covered. There's a couple dark gifts, there's three dark gifts that aren't a spell, they're a little different, but we'll cover those when we get to them. So is the players accept, accept the dark gift, or they lose the wisdom save, you're gonna reveal these things. Number one, what the dark gift actually is, and the mechanic on how it gets to recharge. You're gonna reveal a physical change, the player's gonna physically change. You're gonna reveal a mental change. This allows the player to role play this manifestation of this dark gift, this connection that they've made with this dark vestige. And last but not least, you're gonna reveal that their alignment changes. Every person that touches, uh, that accepts a dark gift, whether it's forced upon them through a failed wisdom saves or they actively accept it, their alignments will become chaotic, no matter what. Good aligned characters become neutral Neutral remain neutral and evil remain evil. So the good ones only the good ones are the only ones that change down to neutral. 
everyone becomes chaotic. And this is that manifestation, this change, this metamorphosis that's happening to you because you've you've touched and, and connected and accepted some very, very serious power, powers from a, a God of unknown origin. It's slowly changing you physically, mentally, your alignment, everything. Now, there are three secrets that you will not not reveal to the players unless they happen, if they happen and unless they happen. Every player that receives a dark gift will receive a boon, a good thing, a bad thing, a bane, and when they use the dark gift, they're gonna have to roll a uh, constitution save, sorry, a Christmas save, DC 10, or they're gonna also suffer short-term madness. They're gonna use the dark gift still, but they're gonna suffer short-term madness. Now, if the player fails uh, the charisma save and suffers short-term madness, the next time they use the dark gift, that DC is gonna go from 10 to 11. Every time they fail, it's gonna increase 11, 12, 13, 14. When it reaches 15, you're gonna roll on the long-term madness table. Players are gonna start suffering long-term consequences, madness consequences. If that DC from failing using the dark gifts ever gets to 20, that means you've failed 10 times using your dark gift. If it gets to 20, you're gonna be suffering indefinite madness. You're gonna be rolling on that table. And what this is showing you is as you're using dark gifts, you are becoming chaotic in nature. Your mental and your physical body is starting to change. You are now slowly becoming corrupt, going insane, becoming mad with this, this huge power that, that has been manifesting in you. And so you're slowly becoming insane as you're using this dark power. So that's how it works. Now, one important note, very important note, if you have a bane, if you get more than one dark power, your bane always overrides your boon. So for instance, let's say you get a boon, a good, good secret boon that you're resistant to lightning damage. And then you get another dark gift and that bane is you're vulnerable to lightning damage. Well, the, the bane will always override the boon. So if, you already, if it says you're resistant, and now all of a sudden you take another gut, dark gift and says, well, your boon is you're vulnerable to lightning damage, the boon will always override the good thing. The second thing is any physical or mental changes that may overlap. Let's say one, one of them where your hair turns red and then you take another dark gift, your hair turns black, I would describe this as the second one kind of slowly evolving and changing. So your hair that's red, and all of a sudden black streaks start forming in it. So the physical and mental changes are kind of woven together. The boons always override, I'm sorry, the banes always override the boons. The bad things always override the good things. And those three things are secrets. The role is secret, the boon, the bane secret. They only materialize and reveal if something happens. And we'll show you how that works in a little bit. So that gives you an idea of how this whole process, the mechanic works. And we're gonna review that again as we hit those dark gifts. Okay, let's jump into it here. And we have a player character here. Oh my gosh, it's me. There I am, the player character. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be exploring this place. So the first here we're gonna talk about the lower level is this main uh, temple area. And you can see this uh, from the upper level when you're looking down in the ba balcony. There's two giant stairwells that lead down. By the way, I'm using Monk's active tile triggers, so if the players go up in these up areas, it'll take them to the next floor versus going down. I've got some traps and tricks I will show you as well. The one thing that you're gonna notice down here, we're in X05, uh, the Temple of Lost Secrets, is there is a large statue, 40-foot statue, at the far end of this temple. And if the players come down here, meaning me, show up down here. Inside this statue in the head, the statue's hollow, there's a secret door in the back. Inside the statue is an Arcanoloth that has disguised itself as a wizard. And here it is, here it is disguised as a wizard, Henrik Stolt. So it's up in the head and it can see the players, right? And by the way, just so you know how I did this on, um, in uh, Foundry is I put uh, one-way walls up here with a secret door in the back. So technically, Henrik can see me up here, but I can't see Henrik in the statue. So there's the statue, I can see the statue, but Henrik is in the statue, he can see me. Now the first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna hear this booming voice as soon as you step down onto the temple floor. Leave now or be destroyed. 
players will identify the voice is coming from the statue. Now, if the players do not leave, you're going to roll, get right into a combat encounter, and the Iconocloth, uh, uh, as Henrik Stoll, will start firing off its spells. And it's got some pretty fierce spells. It's got magic missiles. It'll start firing those off. It does have fireball, fear, uh, uh, firebolt. Start firing those spells out at you. You're going to be in a combat encounter. The second thing that will happen if, this is a big if, if these, uh, on the, we're up on the upper floor, this is that down area down here. If these uh, flame skulls up here, um, you haven't dispensed with them, that's an X-17, they will come over to these arrow slits and start firing down their magic missiles upon you. So you're going to add them to the combat encounter here. So this could be pretty, pretty nasty. He's hiding up here. Now, if the players manage to get around the back of this thing, and and they do find the secret door into this thing, and and confront um, confront Henrik here, uh, in here, he is going to change his tune very quickly. He is an old wizard. He's gonna um, this iconocloth, you know, which his actual real name is Nephron. I'll show you. I have him here in two characters. The same stat blocks, but just two different images. I have him as Nephron here. He's disguised as Henrik. And what Henrik's going to do is say, Hey, I'm, I'm the old wizard guarding the Amber Temple. Now, uh, Henrik, the disguise of Nephron, knows about Exanthar and knows Exanthar's lost his mind. And Nephron here is here. His purpose here is to gain secrets, gain, gain the passwords, to get into the Amber Vaults, to learn as much magic as it's just obsessed with power and magic, wanting to become a powerful magic user, and has disguised himself as this wizard and has told Exanthar that he's one of the wizards protecting the Amber Temple. Now remember, Exanthar has lost his memory. He doesn't know any better. If you restore Kazan's memory, Kazan will know that there was never a wizard named Henrik Stolt and realize that Henrik Stolt is really an Arcanoloth uh, and very dangerous. At this point, if either the players learn that Henrik Stolt is not who he says he is, or if Kazan, uh, his memory is returned, Nephron will appear as Nephron. And Nephron will just constantly, constantly harass the player, unless Xanthar, or I mean in this case, Kazan or the players decide to kill him. Now, uh, Nephron does have on him a couple of items on here. It has a, a pair of owl spectacles that are pretty cool. Um, they give you the, blair, the, the wearer blind sight for 360 degrees up to 60 feet. He also has a roll of, of useful items. However, before that, if they run into Henrik Stolt, Henrik Stolt will try to befriend the players, but Henrik Stolt is completely manipulative. Henrik Stolt will send the players into traps. The Henrik Stolt will try to get the players to do his bidding for him. He will be misleading. He will lie. Remember, this Iconothloth doesn't know too much. It's trying to get information. So it's going to try to get the players to open up vaults, try to get the players to do things that it knows will kill the players or get... Nephron the information he wants. So that's how I would role-play him until the players reveal who he is or, or kill, kill him. Uh, or, again, Kazan's memory returns. So that's what's going here in this main area here. Now, uh, let's go ahead. We're going to go to the... Uh, we're going to go ahead and do the east side of the temple, that area over here. Once we finish that, we're going to do the west side, then we'll do the south, and then we'll do the north. <coughs> So as the players travel through the, the main temple area here, they come into these archways here, uh, X05 amber reflections on both sides, leaning to the east and west wings. The ceiling is, is, is honed smooth like a mirror, uh, and it reflects the, the players. The players can see themselves up there, but the images of the players don't move like the players. In fact, the images of themselves are warning the players, leave, this is unsafe, go back now. This is an illusion that the wizards use. It's kind of like a, a, an illusionary spell to let people know that you're entering in a very dangerous zone. Now remember something here. You're in the lower levels of a temple that serves three purposes. The first purpose we already learned about the upper levels is learning about and storing magic. There's a lectern hall. There's a library. It's the, 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 the secret library of all the great magic being stored here. The lower level is a prison. These amber vaults with the amber sarcophagi are prisons uh, harnessing great dark 
vestiges that, that have horrible powers that can never be released again. That's what's going on in the lower levels. So anything to warn people from don't, don't go in here. You're walking into literally a dungeon with very, very powerful, uh, powerful evil, evil creatures in here. So that's what they're going to see. Now, there's a third thing that we're going to learn about later on in this video. The third thing that's going on here in the Amber Temple down here in the lower levels is pretty cool. So as soon as you step in here uh, into X32, the lower east hall, you're going to notice to the north that there, there was a cave in. The, the, the ceiling has collapsed. There's a bunch of rocks and rubble um, up to the north. And as soon as you step in, you're going to see this giant, really nasty looking, Skeletor Minotaur come at you and attack you. Now, there's only one here. There used to be two. The other one's dead and been destroyed from the collapse in the north. But this one's going to come up and start attacking right away. Now, this is a normal rules as written Skeletor Minotaur. It's pretty nasty. It's got some strengths, great axe, gore, and a charge. Um, a couple of things to role play on the Skeletor Minotaur. It is only going to remain here in X32 area. If the players leave and go to the main temple room, It'll go back to patrolling. These things are undead magical beasts that were assigned as a last line of defense to protect the Amber Vaults. So I can imagine these things patrolling for centuries in these hallways. Uh, there's only one on this side now, and there's two uh, of them on the other side. By the way, I got rid of the Barovian witches and the wish broom. I just thought that was silly, so I got rid of that. So instead, uh, you got this Minotaur now again, if the players run and leave, they get outside of this amber reflection area, the, this thing won't, won't continue to follow the players. It returns back to its patrolling uh, up and down into in this chamber over here. Now we're gonna hit these uh, other rooms over here before we do the, the, the amber chamber. You're gonna notice two doors right away. By the way, uh, if the players decide to remove the rebel to try to get through to get to the north area here and remove the rubble, which they can. I would make it some strength checks and stuff like that. They got to move all these blocks. It will take them some time. There's a cavity in here, and inside the cavity, you have these amber gasks. Let's talk about these amber gasks for a second. So if the players do get through, they manage to get through here, they're going to run into these amber gasks. And these things are nasty looking. Let's just take a look. They're kind of, ugh, ugh, uh, as they say in Portugal, conoja. Um, this is a gas, and it's slowly going through this metamorphosis into this kind of spidery looking bug thing. It's really disgusting looking. It's just vile and, and foul looking. And these amber gas have a special feature on them. They have spider climb uh, is a unique feature, and they, they also have this nasty stench. But the spider climb on it, and you're going to realize later where that spider climb comes from. So if the players break through and they get into this cavity here, there's still a wall of rocks they'll still have to get through. These three amber gas will begin to attack the player in here. So that's in case the players start trying to move through these rocks to try to get north. All right, if we go into the north room here, this room here is X35. This is the east uh, disciple quarters. And as soon as they step in there, they're gonna realize, well, there's a glyph on the door. The glyph of the door is kind of worn away. The door is cracked. You step in there, this place has been ransacked centuries ago. There's dust and cobwebs all over the place. <clears throat> and in the center of the room stands this incapacitated shield guardian. I'm gonna turn off this little light here. I turn this light on, I'll show you that in a second and, and how this works. So if they step into the room, here I am stepping into the room, you're gonna see this giant shield guardian. It's completely, you're gonna see this massive set of armor made of steel and wood just standing there, not moving. It must have been there centuries. There's like cobwebs and stuff, stuff attached to it. Now, if the players have the control amulet, this is the amulet that Villainous uh, found, the mage that's up in the lecture room in, in X09, the lecture hall that he found in there. If Villainous is with you, or if the players do have that amulet, as soon as they step into the room, What's going to happen, and I do this in, in Foundry, is I would t put the dim light on the, on the creature to, to point one, turn it on, and all of a sudden you see this, this creature kind of glowing with this energy. The amulet around your neck, or if you're holding it, starts to vibrate. The characters can make that realization at this point. That's a control am amulet. And as long as you're within a certain distance, you can control the shield guardian. The shield guardian is becoming active because you're getting, you're getting close to it with the control amulet. 
This is pretty cool. If you have this, you can use this to your advantage as you're exploring um, uh, the uh, lower levels of the Amber Temple. All right, this room, by the way, a little backstory on this room. This is the room for disciple wizards. Uh, usually uh, two, one, two, three disciple wizards would be staying in this room. You have to remember, uh, and we'll find out down here in the next room, is the master uh, bedroom here. So if we step into the next room down here, this is X34. This is the master's bedroom. Um, and the way the structure, uh, the hierarchy in the Amber Temple works is the the wizard master was in charge of the the lower level of the Amber Temple. And this is where he lived down here. And he was in charge of making sure that the vaults were sealed, that nothing could get in them, probably cast the spells of the illusion spells. And also down here where the wizard disciples lived. The upper level is where the wizard guardian lived. So the second in command of the Amber Temple was the wizard master, who this was his bedroom, X-34. And you see the room again is ransacked. There was a glyph of warning on the door that has worn away. It's kind of cracked. You're going to come in here. You are going to notice on the bedpost two golden hawks. They weigh about one pound each. They're worth 25 gold, but they're magical. An Arcana check DC 18 will reveal that they're magical. And what these gold hawks do is if you possess one of the gold hawks, the, the, the character that's possessing it, the rock, the giant bird by the bridge at Salenka Pass will not attack you. Now, one of the things that wizards, who were once druids, realized is both nature is a great line of defense. I mean, the Amber Temple is built way up in the mountains, so the snow and the blizzards and the, and, the, and the crevices and all that kind of stuff is a great natural line of defense. Well, so is the rock. The rock is going to keep creatures from trying to get to the Amber Temple, not because the rock knows the Amber Temple exists, it just is going to hunt creatures that get near it. So instead of destroying or doing stuff, the, the druids and the wizards are very smart. They said, well, we'll build a golden clock that allows the rock to live its normal, happy life on the mountain. And secretly, it's through, through no fault or knowledge of its own, protecting the Amber Temple. But this allows the wizards to leave the Amber Temple, cross the bridge, and, and, and leave the Amber Temple in, in the mountains without the rock attacking it. So these, uh, this, this golden hawk was a magic item that was used to allow the wizards or druids or whoever here to travel to and fro as needed to the Amber Temple without worrying about the rock attacking them. So that was what the magic ability of these golden hawks do. There's two of them here uh, that will be hugely helpful if the players have not dealt with the rock yet. Now, again, the rock won't attack the, the only the player that has it. So if you're standing next to another player that doesn't have it, that player is, well, as we say, SOL, shit out of luck. I mean, the rock's going after them, but not you because you have the golden hawk. There's two of them. All right. Now we're moving out here. You've dispatched with the uh, Minotaur. You're, you're back into X-32, and we're going to go into our first Amber Vault. Now, a couple things to note about the Amber Vaults. The Amber Vaults are protected with passwords, and there are two ways in which you can learn the passwords. If you restore Xanthar's memory, he realizes he's Kazan, he will share with you the passwords to all the vaults. The second way is you can get the passwords that were written on those scrolls in the, in the secret scroll repositories up on the upper level, there's one on the west side and the east side. Remember, the players don't know what the words mean or what they're for, but they are the passwords to the arcane locks on these doors. Now, the only way to get through these doors is to bust, bust them down, uh, um, these doors here, and we'll take a look at it. Uh, the, the door is, uh, uh, is 100 hit points, DC 15. Um, you can try to bust down the doors to get into the in the room if you don't have the password. However, if you decide to destroy the lock and destroy you know, bust through the door and the and the, the door is destroyed, the hit points are taken down to zero and you're you're able to get in, this whole area is going to just burst with this kind of necrotic damage red energy. And I set this up on uh, monk's active tile trigger. So this is the way it works. I'll show you how this works here. Let's say that you've got these two doors are locked. You don't know the password. You're going to destroy the doors to get in because you want to get into this, this place down here. Now this here, this white area, uh, you can see it as the Dungeon Master and Foundry. Uh, the players cannot. It's an invisible tile. And all the players that are within this visible tile, if you destroy the door here, right, it's been destroyed for you to go into the room, 
This whole area, all the players are going to take damage from this necrotic energy, and this is how it works. You, as the game master, just double click in this tile, and every every character, good, bad, and different, every creature in this tile, in this big tile area, is going to suffer damage. This, the game is going to pause, and I'll show you how this works here. I'll just double click on it and show you. Uh, the tokens will stop moving, game will pause, there will be a sound file, there will be some light, so light up for 8 seconds. Light will go off and the players will take 40 10 worth of damage. So let's go ahead and activate that show you how it happens. So you're standing in here, you've blown up the door, destroyed it. And I just took 12 damage. There we go. And you, see, you can saw the damage come off of me and it shows right here. I just took 12 damage. I'm down to 88, 88 hit points. So it'll ha that'll happen to every single character that's in here, uh, in here. Okay, we're going into our first vault. This is X33A vault. The password here is Schlax. Uh, and when you head into this vault, uh, you're immediately going to notice there's a there's a hole in the ceiling uh, that leads up. That hole in the ceiling comes from. I'll take you up to the upper upper uh, floor real quick. Uh, if you remember uh, up here. In the uh, southeast annex, there was a hole in the floor with a 20-foot drop that takes you down into one of the one of the amber uh, vaults. Well, this is the amber vault that takes you down to. So if you tried to go down that way, and, this, and the flame skulls came up, you might have already attacked and killed these flame skulls. If not, as soon as that door opens, whether you use a password or if you blow that door open, you're going to be in a fight with three flame skulls, and here they are, right here. So you got these three nasty flame skulls to deal with. Now, if you come in here, you're going to notice, you're going to hear this low pitch hum resonating. You can feel it in your body. The room pulses with this amber, amber light. And each one of these sarcophagi, there's three of them in here. Dark whispers begin to fill your mind, but you're not able to exactly hear what they're saying. Now, I'm going to show you how this works. These are tiles over each one of these. And the way that it works, I'm just going to click on it and show you how the tiles work. This is for those of you watching Foundry. Again, Monk's active tile trigger. When, when a player, when a player, anyone, double clicks on it, the game will stop and pause. The journal will open only for the triggering player. So that only the triggering player will see the journal entry. And they're going to hear the voice of the dark vestige. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. This is really exciting and show you how this works. So here I am. My character comes over, and you're going to explain to the players, uh, you can go over there and touch one of the amber sarcophagi. If you do, go ahead and just double click on the amber stone. The game will pause, and only you, the, that player, will see the vision uh, of the, the, the amber of the dark vestige and hear what the dark vestige has to say to you. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is what the player is going to experience when they double click on the amber. They do not rest and need to be awakened. They will serve in death as they did in life. Take my dark gift and command the dead who will rise before you and vanquish your enemies. That's so awesome. That's one of the voice acting from one of our Patreon supporters uh, shared with us a voice acting again. All the dark, uh, the dark vestiges you'll hear, all but I think two, are all uh, our Patreon members and everyone that, that participated, you're going to hear their voice. So a huge shout out, big thank you to that. Now, what the player is going to see is they're going to see the sky is gray, but the, there are no clouds, there are no trees or hills or mountains. The land upon which you stand is wet. A strong wind begins to blow. A dark shadow appears, slowly becoming a demon. Here's the picture of it. The player can also see it. Here it is. Look at this. This demon begins to appear. This is... So they've touched the amber sarcophagi. They've made that uh, uh, telepathic link, and they're having this vision now being transformed of, of what the dark vestige was when it was fully manifested, and they're going to see that. And there's going to be a hint in what they see and what the dark vestige says to them. Uh, you will, uh, they will serve death as they are in life. They need to be awakened, command the dead. So here's the dark gift. You're going to tell the first three things you're going to tell the player immediately if they accept it. They're not going to have any clue with what it, what it is. They will not know what the dark gift is unless they accept it 
Or they say, I don't want to accept it. They have to roll that wisdom save. If they fail it, they'll learn what it is because they're going to get it. Uh, if they if they succeed in the wisdom save, they'll never know what the dark gift is. They'll only know what the dark vestige said to them. So here's the dark gift. The dark gift is they'll be able to create undead. That's a spell as an action. Now the dark gifts uh, act as an action, like a charm. They're not a spell. You don't need a spell slot. You don't need any components. You don't need to be a magic user. You're just going to be able to cast create undead as an action. Now, this recharges after a long rest on a 6. So after a long rest, if you've used it, you roll a 1d6. If you roll a 6, it recharges. You can use it again. After a long rest, if you roll a 1 through 5, it won't recharge. You have to wait to another long rest to try to recharge it and use it again. So it might be, uh, you might never be able, I mean, there is a small probability that you'll never be able to cast it again, but you'll get to do it at least once. Now, your physical uh, change, your eyes turn white and your teeth turn black. The mental change, you crave to eat dead or rotting flesh, bones of the dead or dirt from graveyards or wherever dead have fallen. Now here are the secrets. Again, you're not going to tell your players this. The first thing is the boon, the undead fortitude. This is huge. The player's not going to know this until it happens. Again, boons, banes, and the madness roll. Don't tell the player until it happens. Boon, Undead Fortitude. If the hit points fall to zero or less, they make a constitution save DC 5 plus the damage they take. If they, make a, if they succeed on it, they fall to one hit point instead. That's a really cool boon for this. The Bane. They must eat the remains of the dead or dirt from graveyards or the recently fallen every 24 hours or suffer one level of exhaustion. The way that I would probably run this is just I, I would be telling them how their body is craving to eat the, the dead and suck on bones and eat graveyard dirt. And then after 24 hours, I would let that level of exhaustion hit if they haven't eaten it. And since you're, you're, you have these body pains, I mean, you're buckling over at this point. You've suffered one level of exhaustion. If they go ahead and eat the flesh, the rotting flesh and the bones or whatever, some dirt from, from a grave or a graveyard, I would remove that one level of exhaustion saying you're okay. But as that 24 hours is approaching again, I would tell them they're eating, having these pains. One of the things we want to do with role playing is let the players figure things out. What we're doing as uh, game masters and dungeon masters are giving them clues and they're, they're learning what these things are. Don't always tell what the players what the mechanics is. Let them discover the mechanics. That's what's happening with these boons and these banes. Now, as I said before, if the player's going to use the dark gift, they're going to have to roll. You're going to say, roll a charisma save. If they make the save, whether they make the save or not, they get to use the dark gift. The save is only to determine if they suffer short-term madness. Now, if they fail the save, that DC, they still get to use the Dark Gift, but they're going to suffer short-term madness. You're going to roll in the short-term madness table. We have one right here. Before you get to roll on that, let's just go ahead and roll for fun. See what happens. If I failed, the character begins babbling and is incapable of normal speech or spell casting for 1d10 minutes. How many minutes? For four minutes. So for 1d10 10 minutes, uh, for four minutes in this case, that's what's going to happen. So um, now that my DC for using that dark gift, my DC is going to increase uh, to 11 next time. If my DC ever gets up to 15, I'm going to be using long-term madness, DC 20, we're going to be indefinite madness. So this is just kind of representing this kind of, you know, you're, you're slipping further more into sanity and madness as you're using this dark gift. So this is the first one, really excited to show it to you. Okay. Stepping over, I'm walking down to this, this amber sarcophagi. I raise my hand up and place my hand upon the amber, and I make this telepathic link, and this is what happens. Carry forth the power of my storms upon the land. Accept my dark gift, and unleash the power of wind, lightning, and thunder down on those who stand against you. <laughs> That's not so cool. Okay, the sky grows dark. So the player's going to see the sky grows dark. Storm clouds form overhead. Lightning strikes with roars of thunder. And the booming voice says what it just says. You got the words there as well. Here's the image of it. Look at this. Just, it's like a cloud lightning god just kind of moving through the storm. This is the vision that you're having as you've made this connection. I'm going to just turn down that temple sound a little bit there. Okay, now the dark gift here, he gives you a pretty good clue, doesn't he? So you're going to be able to cast Lightning Bolt, Thunder Wave, or Gust of Wind. These are all pretty good spells. Uh, level 3, 
uh, spell, the Thunder Wave, I like the Thunder Wave spell, and the Gust of Wind spell, any one of those spells you get to cast as an action, only one of them, and they recharge after short rest. So you get to use one of them, and then next short rest you can use another one, and next short rest you can use another one. So they, that, that Dark Gift ability, you get a choice, choice of three, recharges after short rest. Very cool. Your physical change, your hair turns white and your hands begin to tremble. Your mental change, you can no longer whisper. Imagine that. You're a storm now. You have, you've been infused with the storm power. You're going to only speak loud. That's not always a good thing. Now, here are the secrets. Your secret boon is you're going to be resistant to lightning and thunder damage. So don't tell this to the players. So the first time, and if, they may never, but if they ever experience lightning or thunder damage, they're going to have resistance to it. So don't tell the player until the first time that happens. They're Bane. They're going to disadvantage on dexterity checks that require careful hand movements like sleight of hand or lock picking. So you're going to describe your players, you know, you're, you're, you're trembling. Your hands are always trembling. You're trying to pick a lock, and if they're going to roll a check or do some sleight of hand, you're going to go, you got to roll disadvantage. You go, why? Your hands are trembling. At that moment, you're going to explain that dark gift that you've accepted. Your hands are always trembling. You're going to be rolling disadvantage on any careful hand movement checks going forward. Again, if they use the dark gift, they're going to have to roll that charisma save, DC 10. Uh, otherwise, they're going to suffer short-term madness. Again, they still get to use the dark gift. It's just whether they suffer madness while using the dark gift or not. Okay, let's go to the next one. The next one here is by our own Elevent Kari. She's one of the moderators on our Discord channel. And she was also a player in my Curse of Strahd game. Elvin Kari played the monk Leah. Uh, uh, in addition, she's a DM for her own Curse of Strahd. So this, this is Elvin Kari. Here we go. So I put my hand up on the amber, close my eyes, and all of a sudden I've made the link and... Please, spread my lovely boxes throughout the world. For I am stuck here. Finish what I have started. I grant you my dark gift to share my boxes with others. So you see this putrid cloud of gas around you and before you stands this strange little creature and her eyes are darting back and forth nervously as she speaks to you. I imagine her as like kind of a, a, a nymph or a little pixie creature that's talking to you, you know, in here. And she gives you a clue. Spread my poxes throughout the world. Smallpox, disease, or whatever. Uh, let's take a close image of her. Look at that. There she is. Just kind of like a little fairy speaking to you but you don't realize it's blood and disgusting stuff that's going to happen. She's going to give you the ability to cast Contagion as an action. It's a fifth level spell. That's a nasty, nasty spell on here. It recharges uh, on a five or six after a long rest. So this recharges on a five or six after a long rest. Your physical change, unfortunately, well, you break out in blisters and boils. Pus and blood run from each burst blister and boil on your body. Your mental change, you envy those who are beautiful and you treat them with spite and malice. You are your boon. Your secret boon is you're immune to disease. You can never be sick ever again. So you're totally immune to any disease. Your disadvantage, though, is on persuasion and charisma checks. Well, you can imagine covered in boils and, and, and uh, blisters that are bursting with blood and pus. You're not going to be persuading anybody anytime soon. Again, don't forget you're going to have to roll uh, the DC uh, 10 uh, uh, charisma on there, other, otherwise suffer short-term madness. All right, very cool. Let's go up to our next chamber here, and we are gonna, we know the password, so we don't die out here. And we go inside, and in this particular one, the, uh, whoop, the, the vault here, the password of the vault is Maverus. If you know that, you're either gonna get that password again from one of the secret spell scrolls, or Kazan will reveal it to you. Let's go ahead and go through each one of these here. I'm gonna to go to the north one first. I'm gonna put my hand on the amber sarcophagi and... The mind can be as full or as dark as the moon. I have the power to darken minds and many I have destroyed. Take my dark gift and darken the minds of those who stand against you. Very cool. The clue is right in there. The power to darken minds, many I've destroyed. Take my dark gift, darken the minds of those who stand against you. So what you're seeing here is you're standing in a desert under a hot white sun. Slowly the moon slides in front of the sun, creating a perfect eclipse. 
The desert becomes dark and cold. The hooded figure materializes and hovers in the sky and says that to you. Um, there's the image of it. Really, really cool. What's, what's cool about this is you're not given a lot, but you're given clues of what that dark gift could mean. Something to do with the mind. So let's check it out. Again, if the player accepts it or fails the wisdom, they're going to learn what the dark gift is. This is a pretty potent one. You're going to gain the ability to cast both Feeble Mind, which is a really powerful spell, or Mind Blank, either one of those, as an action. This recharges on a six after a long rest. So it's going to be hard to recharge it. You get it at least once, recharges on a six. Now, physical change to the character's face becomes expressionless. You're unable to read any read a person's face anymore. Your mental changes, you lose empathy. You just be, All your empathy is gone at this point. Your boon, you roll advantage on saving throws against any charm or similar spells that are trying to control the mind, your mind. This is huge. So later in the game, if, if for instance, Strahd or someone tries to charm you, when it's time to roll your saving throw, you go, well, I'm going to roll my saving throw. You just tell the player, roll advantage. And they're going to go, why? The dark gift you have is, is, is embodied you, empowered you to resist certain spells that control charm uh, or control your mind. So this is a huge boon. Let the player discover this. This is what's really cool. The vulnerability, though, on the bane is now you're vulnerable to psychic damage. So you will be, if there's any psychic damage, uh, you're vulnerable to that. So the bane is pretty bad. You're going to have vulnerability to that. Take double damage. Pretty, pretty nasty. All right, let's do the next one here. I'm stepping down here in the Amber Vault. I'm walking over to the one on the east side. I place my hand on the Amber, and make the telepathic link, and... I meld into rock. And move Earth before me. As I hunt down my prey. Take my dark gift and no longer let the rock, dirt, sand, or stone stop you. Ugh, wow. The ground trembles and, uh, as the dirt and rock and sand blast hundreds of feet into the air. A giant worm bursts out of the ground in the air, twists and turns its large mouth over you, and it begins to speak. That's what you're seeing, and you've heard the dark vestige speak to you. This is uh, Taraka Medes. The giant worm here. Let's take a look at the image of this thing. Look at this thing. I can imagine just freaking out. Okay. It gives you a clue what those dark gift is. In this case, the dark gift is to move earth. It's a great level six spell. Uh, it recharges on a five or six after a long rest. You got to roll that 1d6 on five or six. It does recharge. But you get two dark gifts with this one. You get to also meld into stone. This is a third level spell. This obviously fits really well in the dark vestige. Obviously, this thing is moving underground through the dirt, busting through dirt and sand and rocks. So you get to melt into stone or move earth so it can hunt down its prey and its enemies. Really cool uh, dark gifts there. Physical change. Your skin and hair become dirty. No matter how many times you wash, dirt always appears on your body and on your hair. Your mental change. You don't like high or open spaces. You like darkness and tunnels and caves. You're, you're, you know, again, you're being infused with this, this dark vestige, what it was in life. And so you're, you're looking for, you're, you're, you're mimicking uh, and slowly metamorphosizing both physically and mentally uh, to some of these things in this dark vestige. Now, your uh, boons, you can have advantage on dexterity. So if, obviously, if this thing can move dirt and melt into stone and move around, you're going to get some benefits, dexterity saves. But you're going to have disadvantage on your charisma checks. I mean... You're dirty, and you look dirty all the time. So your charisma checks, okay. Don't forget you got to roll that charisma save DC 10. Otherwise, you're going to suffer some madness on here. All right, let's go to the next dark gift. I'm going to step down here, place my hand on the amber sarcophagi to the south, and see what happens. Here we go. Cast your eyes but once upon my deadly beauty. No one can resist the allure of lust-fueled passion. I share with you my darkest secrets of lust and envy. That's so cool. So <laughs> in your mind, after you make this, this link, you're laying on this chaise lounge covered with soft silks. This woman of exquisite beauty descends the steps just out of light. You're unable to look away as she speaks softly to you. That's what she says. 
Let's take a look at her here. There she is. She's got this kind of cat wolf thing with her. She's looking down upon you and she says those words. Uh, I share with you my darkest secrets of lust and envy. So what are the dark gifts? The player's gonna get both the suggestion or the, the charm person spell as their dark gift and cast one or the other as an action. This recharges after a short rest. So you get to use these quite, quite often, the charm person or suggestion, one or the other as an action gets to recharge. Then you get to use one or the other again as an action. Now your hair begins to turn gold and with black streaks becomes very long. Your lips turn bright red. Your fingernails grow long and sharp. Your mental change, your character becomes more narcissistic and selfish, loves cats and wolves. Your, your boon, well, you're going to roll advantage on your charisma saving throws, uh, for sure. Uh, your bane is disadvantage on attack rolls against beasts. You know she likes these cats, she likes these wolves, you, you, you uh, empathize with that, and so you're going to roll disadvantage on any attack rolls against any beast because she loves beasts, this, uh, this vestige here. Again, you got to roll those uh, Christmas saves if you use one of those dark gifts if, to, to, to avoid suffering short-term madness. There we go here. So some crazy dark powers in here. Let's, let's, let's head up here. Now, we're going to go through here north, and uh, I'll show you what we're talking about here. The only way to get up to this chamber is from the upper, there's two ways actually. If you get through this rocks here, you deal with these uh, amber gas and then you break through these rocks here, you'll get to the other side over here. <coughs> Excuse me. The other way is from the upper level of the temple up here. If you remember from the other video, there's a secret door that leads to some stairs that take you to the north eastern part of the, the lower level uh, in there. And I, I'll show you. I, by the way, I've got Monk's active tile triggers uh, for teleport, so you can see that. So if I step in here, boom, I'm going to show up in the upper upper level. Let me just click on the upper level. There I am. And you're going to see me. There I am. I'm in the upper level. So Monk's active tile triggers will, will teleport you to the upper or lower level. There we are. So I'm going to be down here in the lower level, and you're going to notice, again, this is the cave in here. The door of this one has been open. And when you step in here, you're not going to see them at first. They're all invisible. Let me make them invisible first. Is there some more of these ghasts? And these ghasts have spider climbs. So when you step into this room, and this is uh, X33 uh, C vault, um, the ghasts are hanging up on the ceiling. They're not moving. So you need a passive perception about 12 or above, and you're going to notice these things hanging on the ceiling. There's four of them. Uh, if the players don't notice some of them, the gas will gain surprise. They'll just drop from the ceiling on top of the players, and you're going to go right into a combat encounter if you don't see them. So you got these amber gas. Again, these things are nasty looking. They're kind of metamorphosizing into these things. They have the, uh, the feature of spider climb on there. So gas with spider climbs are just kind of these nasty things in here. You're going to have to deal with them. They've got this kind of amber glow about them. Check this out. You can see this amber glow uh, on them here. Look at that. They've been in here. You're going to quickly learn why these ghasts are kind of metamorphosizing into these kind of spider, nasty-looking creatures. So before that, we're going to check out these, these amber sarcophagi. One of them is going to, to, to tell you what's going on. So I'm going to step to the south first. Oh, south, I'm going to put my hand on that amber, close my eyes, and make the link and see what happens. Are you ready? To lead your armies to victory. To watch men shed blood and bone for your cause. For men to walk into hell's fire on your command. Accept my dark gift and I shall knight you with the powers to rule over men. Pretty amazing one. So you're kneeling, you're, you are kneeling in a large throne room. That's the vision that you're having. Sitting before you is a large skeleton king. It stands, steps towards you, looming above you. It looks down and says those words. So let's take a look at that image. That was really, I mean, that's pretty, pretty powerful stuff there. There's some clues there. Accept my gift and I shall grant you the powers to rule over men. What are the gifts? You get two of them here. You get the Gia spell. Uh, which is you cast as an action that recharges on a five or six after a long rest. Very powerful charm spell here. Obviously, if you're going to charm men to do your bidding and charm an army, 
having that would certainly be something you'd want. The other one you get as command as an action. This is a first level spell. This recharges after a short rest. So you're going to get two, uh, two dark gifts out of this one. Uh, one that recharges on a five or six, and then one recharges after every short rest in there. Very, very cool. Now, physical change. You march or walk with a stride. Your face grows stern. You no longer smile. Your eyes turn gold in color. Mental change. You become arrogant, stubborn, demanding to be a leader. Now, your boons, you're going to have advantage on your charisma saves, and your bane, you're going to have a disadvantage on your intelligence saves. Again, you're not going to reveal these things until they manifest throughout the game. If they if they come up in the game, then you're going to reveal them, and then you're going to explain why to the player. It's, it was part of that dark gift. These are things that are affecting you positively and or negatively. Okay, let's go up to the top here. I think we did Delvnar. Let's do the top one here. Yeah, we did that one. Delvnar. No, we didn't do that one yet. Let's go here. Let's go to this one. Okay, so I'm going to put my hand up here and... We have devoured nature's bounty for an eternity and reaped its rewards. Accept my dark gift and feast on everything nature has to offer. So you're standing before this massive creature. This is what you're seeing. The body is covered in mouths and teeth of all sorts, and you feel the hot breath of the mouths speak to you in unison. There's a clue in there. You've devoured nature's bounty for an eternity, reap its rewards. My dark gift, take my garf gift and feature, feast on everything nature has to offer. Let's take a look at this image here. Look at this, all these teeth and these mouths. Fairly nasty looking uh, creature. So what are, we, what are we getting from this? Well, the player's gifts, you're gonna get two of them. These are pretty potent ones. First one here is you get Hero's Feast, which is just amazing. You get to cast a Hero's Feast there. That recharges on a six uh, after a long rest. And you also get Good Berry as an action, level one spe spell. Eating a berry restores one hit points. The berry provides enough nourishment to sustain a creature for one day. Really, really cool. Uh, so that you get that one hit point in here. Now, the physical change. The, the player is going to lose their teeth. They begin to fall out and disappear because Delver Nar is taking the teeth and, and it's, your teeth are materializing on its body. So your teeth are falling out and disappearing. Pretty soon you'll have no teeth. Mental change, you're gonna hunger always for rotting food. You hate fresh food, so you're gonna love rotting food. You're gonna just love the smell. You're just gonna be obsessed with rotting food. Now what is your boon? Well, remember that good berry that restores one hit point? Your boon is the first time you eat one of those, you gain 1d4 plus one hit points. That's a huge advantage there. You get that extra 1d4 plus the one hit points eating that. Makes that really awesome. Your bane, well, you're vulnerable to poison damage now. So you're vulnerable to poison. <coughs> and that's interesting here because our next dark gift up here, step up here, you get this one. Here we go. Put my hand up on the uh, amber sarcophagi, make my telepathic link, then what do I hear and see? Fools think they can escape, but nothing is out of my reach. Let me grant you my dark gift to corner and trap your prey. You see you're caught in a large web. Light barely penetrates the web as it parts, and this part man, part spider creature steps forth. Let's take a look at this thing. Ugh. As they say in Portugal, canoja meaning disgusting. Um, so obviously nothing is out of your reach. You can corner and trap your prey. Well, what are you gonna get? You're gonna get dark gift of casting web here or using spider climb as an action. This lasts for one hour uh, on, on, on yourself. These recharge after a, a short rest. You can use one or the other and it recharges after a short rest. Your physical change. Small spiders live in your hair and clothes. Your gear is always infested with baby spiders. Mentally, you believe that everyone's trying to leave you, and you do whatever you can to keep them around. You know, it kind of fits in with that whole web, you know, casting a web. You, you just think people are trying to leave you. You want them to, to always stay around. You're going to be immune to poison damage. Now, here's the bad, bad news here. If you take this, and then you go down here and get, oh, sorry. If you get, take this dark gift and then you take this other dark gift, I want to point this out, this is really important. 
this, this bane, vulnerable to poison damage, overrides the boon. So if you take both these dark gifts, you go, oh, cool, I'm immune to poison damage. Then you get this one, you're vulnerable to point of damage. The bane always overrides the boon, so you'll be vulnerable to poison damage in this case. Uh, and the bane is you roll disadvantage on attack rolls and saving rolls against bats and birds. Why? You're covered in baby spiders. You're like the friggin' smorgasbord cafeteria for birds and bats. They're gonna see all those little baby spiders and crawl all over in your hair. They're gonna come and try to uh, attack you. That means you're gonna try to swat them away. And so on your attack rolls and on your saving rolls against birds and bats, you're gonna be rolling disadvantage on those things. So that's your bane. Again, boons and banes don't materialize. Players don't know until those materialize or if those conditions uh, are met or happen. Pretty crazy. So we've covered, <clears throat> over here, we've covered the entire east side of the Amber Temple. Let's, let's head over now to the west side. So we're gonna go over to the west side of the Amber Temple. Here we are on the west side. Again, you're gonna, you're gonna step through this area that's got this uh, uh, reflective amber. And when you get to the west side and X36, you've got two of those minotaurs that are gonna immediately come in and attack you here just like they did on the other side. The other side, remember the, 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 there was a cave-in that destroyed one of the minotaurs. These minotaurs will both attack you. Again, these are just straight up rules as written um, in here. Their features, great axe, score, and charge. Again, if the players move out beyond the amber reflections in the main temples, they'll re return to uh, just their pacing and their guard duty marching up and down this hallway. So they have been here for centuries and their only job is to guard uh, this hallway against any intruders. So once you deal with those, let's go ahead and check out these two rooms over here first, and then we'll do the amber vaults. So we'll go to the lower room first. Just like the other side, this is a disciples' quarters. Remember, the disciples, you got the master wizard that's living down below, you got the disciples. These are disciples' quarters. There's probably you know, one time it probably served uh, quarters, served the wizard disciples, probably two, one or two of them would live in here. But you notice this broken furniture and everything's laying in dust, carved into the wall, probably with a tool or a, a nail or, or, or a dagger is the words, Dark Lord release the vampire vestige, all is lost. This is foreshadowing something the players are going to find out if they find this first. It's not good. Not, not good. The players travel up into this this north room here. Um, this door is unlocked. They go in here, and as soon as they step in, this is another room. This is North Disciples' quarters, uh, where one or two wizard disciples lived. All of a sudden, furniture is going to be like hurled at the players. They're going to be, you know, dodging some furniture, and this poltergeist materializes in front of them. There it is, right here. Got a little lighting effect on him. I'm smiling at him. Uh, the poltergeist is going to, you're going to start hearing the poltergeist saying, you don't know what you've done. You've released the dark vestige of the vampire. The Fae are no longer here to perfect us. We're all doomed. Now imagine this poltergeist is a manifestation of one of the wizard's disciples uh, centuries ago when the Amber Temple was breached and destroyed and destroyed, killing all of them. Uh, most of the wizards are cursing some of them. So it's just reliving this, realizing that one of the dark vestiges has been uh, released. Obviously, the Fae are gone. It's throwing furniture. This poltergeist will continue to throw furniture and attack the player. As soon as the player leaves the room, the poltergeist, I think, in my mind, the poltergeist is as scared in death as it is in life. It won't leave this room. I mean, it's, it's in its life, I mean, you know, it lived here as a disciple, so it wasn't probably... You know that high up, but you can imagine the Dark Lord coming here, and just slaughtering the wizards and the, all the stuff that probably went here. The horrific stuff. It's probably still scared. The poltergeist is throwing furniture and still scared, hiding in this room for centuries. Uh, kind of sad story, if you ask me. All right, we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with the southern one first, and then we'll go north. So we got the southern uh, chamber down here, and the southern chamber. This is 33F uh, chamber. The Vault of Thangob, that's the password to get in here. Again, if you bust down this door and there's any players here and you take the, those hit point, you take the door hit points to zero, destroy the door, 
Just double click on the square. I just took 16 hit points worth of damage. All, it'll roll for every single player in there. It'll take 4d10 worth of damage. Pause the game. It's uh, not a pretty safe for those players. Okay, here we go. So we're going to go down here into this amber chamber. And we're going to go ahead and check these out. I'm going to start with the one on the, the west side. I'm going to raise my hand, place it on the amber sarcophagi, and see what happens. Let's go ahead and just clear our chat log. Here we go. Death is not the end, but the beginning. One must simply reach out and touch death. Let me grant you the dark gift to touch death. So you stand among hundreds of faceless hooded servants as they slowly step forth, disappearing into a dark, twisted mist, rising hundreds of feet above. Red eyes peering among the servants stop when they meet yours. Let's take a look at this image here. Wow. So these servants are just kind of walking up, and there's these, these red eyes peering down at you. Uh, this, this is what you're seeing as you're making this telepathic link. And it gives you a hint. Uh, reach out to touch death. Let me grant you the gift to touch death. You get two super powerful spells here. You get Finger of Death, level 7 spell. Wow. Or Circle of Death, a level 6 spell. You cast either one of those things as an action. This recharges on a 5 and 6. Again, as I said before, not all dark powers or dark gifts are the same. Some are more powerful than others. Some are weaker than others. Some have horrible boons, banes. They're not meant to be balanced. They're meant to each be a surprise and unknown. This is a pretty powerful one. Recharges on a five or six. Physical change, your eyes, hair, and nails become black. Your mental change, you do not like the company of the living. You keep to yourself. The boon, this is a huge boon. Advantage on death saves and immune to power word kill. That's right, you're immune to power word kill. It'll have no effect on you and you have advantage on death saves. The Bane, however, this is not a good one. The beneficiary must succeed a constitution save DC 10 after using this dark gift. And if you fail, you're gonna take 3D6 worth of necrotic damage. So even though you're gonna recharge on a five or six to get to use Finger of Death or Circle of Death, those are powerful spells, you're also gonna to have to roll a constitution save after using it to see if you take necrotic damage. On top of that, you still have to roll that charisma save to see if you're gonna go mad. So this is, this one comes with some pretty bad banes on here, but some really cool boons. Okay, let's go to the next one here. I'm gonna step down to the south, put my hand up, touch the amber sarcophagi, find out what happens. That is creepy. That is super creepy. You stand in complete darkness. A gold mass appears hovering before you. As it begins to speak, hands reach out of the darkness and move the mask in blinding speed from one point to another. The voice echoes as it speaks here. Pretty cool. Let's take a look at, at that image there. That is really kind of creepy. Let's find out what this is. This is a really cool one. This is the only one where you get two that operate at the same time as an action. You get the slow, slows all the creatures around you, the slow spell, all the creatures around you, and the blur on yourself as a single action is automatically recharges after a long rest. This clearly, I mean, he tells you, I'm here, I'm there, I'm everywhere, I'm all spaces in between, I'm nowhere. So everybody around you is gonna slow, you're slowing time down for up to six people around you. And at the same time, you have the blur spell. So it's really hard to hit you. For for everybody else, it's going to seem like you're everywhere. You're blurred and time is slowing for those other people. These these two spells cast together are pretty, pretty cool, especially for some kind of like thief or character that's going to move around really, really quickly. This recharges after a long rest. Physically, you become thin and smaller. Your movements are jerky and quick. I can imagine the character kind of you know, all the time. You attempt to deceive others. You're already seeking ways to gain advantage in situations. Your advantages are obviously dexterity checks and saves. 
but you got some bad disadvantage here. Constitution saves and strength saves. You're going to lose on both of those things. Again, you're going to have to roll on that short-term uh, charisma save, otherwise suffer short-term madness. Pretty cool one. Very cool. Let's go check the next one up here. I'm going to go touch the Amber Sarcophagi here. Attack and rip the flesh from the bones of my enemy. I commend the hounds of hell. Take my dog gift and free my hellhounds and unleash them upon the world. Wow, so what you're seeing is a ground cracks open, flames burst to the surface, a demon stands on the horizon and points at you. Two beasts flank the demon and they begin to charge you and you hear those words spoken. Let's take a look at that image. Wow, look at those beasts charging and that demon pointing towards you. What is the dark gift here? Well, this is a really cool one. You can call forth two hellhounds. That's right, two hellhounds. They will obey your commands as an action for up to 24 hours. You can only have two at a time. This recharges on a six after a, 1D, uh, after a long rest on a 1d6. Recharges on a six. Very, very cool. What happens to you? Well, physically, your eyes and your hair grow red like fire. Mentally, you change. You're only able to speak infernal now. You can't speak any other language at all. You are able to stand common and you're able to understand the languages you knew before in life. So now you can only speak infernal, which is what the hellhounds understand. You are resistant to fire and radiant damage. That is super cool, but you're vulnerable to cold damage. That is not good. So this is a really cool one. To get those hellhounds are really, really, really cool. Okay, awesome. Let's go up and check these other, other dark gifts. We gotta go up here. Say hello to the Minotaurs, pass them. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, we're gonna go to the one here on our left. We've opened up the door, and the password of this one here, this is the uh, Harkotha password, and we're gonna come in here. As soon as you step into this one, uh-oh, you got this nasty creature. This is a Death Slade. It's, it's invisible, it will materialize as you stand in. You're gonna go right into combat. These things are nasty. I mean, this thing has got multiple attack. It's 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 a you know it's a spellcaster. This thing is just just nasty. Very very powerful in here. <clears throat> now I imagine backstory of this desolate is some adventure or something it managed to get in here at some point, probably a long long time ago. Got trapped in here. Doesn't know the password. So, so maybe he came in with some other adventures. Got stuck in here. And it's slowly, be, it's slowly devolving as it's made this dark pact into this what it is today. So perhaps in another life it was a, a spellcaster of some sort. Uh, or, you know, it's got a great sword. All, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of devolved into this creature here, in here. I'm going to leave it open to you on how you want to roleplay this. Whether you want to have any roleplaying moments with this creature. Maybe it was an adventurer from another life here. It doesn't immediately attack. Or maybe it does attack, or maybe it tries to force the player to, 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 to gain some dark powers or something. So this really opens up something rather than just being a straight, straight up combat encounter. All right, let's go ahead and check out the dark gifts. I'm going to start to the south. I'm going to go down here and I'm place my hand upon the amber and see what happens. All manner of beasts has risen against me and landed their furious blows upon my flesh, yet I remain unfazed by their efforts. Take my dark gift and stand against your enemies with steel resolve. Wow, pretty, pretty creepy. You're floating in what you're seeing uh, in, your, in your, your, your state, in your telepathic link, is you're floating on this calm sea and all of a sudden the sea grows dark, waves begin to rise high as this mountains. A massive creature bursts out of the waters, just dwarfing you in their small boat. The mouth could swallow entire villages. The teeth are as large as the tallest trees. These huge luminous eyes look down upon you. This booming, weird voice that you just heard speaks these words to you. Let's take a look at this image here. Oh my gosh, just seeing this thing, I can imagine just trembling in fear. What do you think the dark gift is? Well, this is a unique one. <clears throat> You gain 30 temporary hit points. This recharges after a long rest. This is a huge one. 30 temporary hit points. That's awesome. Now your hair falls out. Your skin becomes dark and leathery. That's the physical change. And 
your mental change. You become aggressive in nature. You dare people to challenge you. I mean, he's kind of telling you this dark, dark power, dark vestige is telling you, you know, all manner of beasts have risen against it, land their furious blows upon their flesh, but he remains unfazed. It's because he has all these extra t temporary hit points, right? Let's talk about the boons and the banes. You're going to get advantage on constitution saves, disadvantage on dexterity saves. Remember, those banes override boons. So if you have one that's giving you advantage on dexterity saves, this one has disadvantage. That means the disadvantage is always going to override. The bane's always going to override the boon. Pretty, pretty powerful one uh, in here for sure. Let's go up to this one over here. I'm going to put my hand up on the amber sarcophagi. Make my telepathic link. Nothing can defeat us, for we are the destroyer of worlds. Take our dark gift, and let your enemies tremble, as you may wish to all who stand against you. So you're standing upon this great mountain. It begins to shake, and the rising over the mountain is this giant five-headed dragon. You heard this was really cool, the patron. For this one, I think it was it was the dungeon madams. They both did a, they did different voices for the different heads of the dragon, which is really cool. So it's telling you here: uh, tremble before, uh, let the enemies tremble before you, lay waste or destroy the words. It must be some kind of powerful. Well, it is. This is another unique one. Your strength becomes twenty five for one hour. Can you imagine the advantages of that? Imagine if you're a melee fighter, a paladin, or a barbarian or something. You get twenty five strength for one hour. That's really cool automatically recharges after a long rest. Your skin becomes scaly like a snake or a dragon, so you're actually kind of physically manifesting into this giant this giant dragon, uh, Tarhawk. Um, your mental state, you think less of those who fight with ranged weapons. You're kind of like dismissive, you're like, yeah, whatever. Use your bow, you go stand away. I'm gonna get right into the action. Uh, you're quick to anger. Your boons, you get advantage on strength saves, obviously. You disadvantage on wisdom saves. Remember, banes override those boons. So if you have a wisdom advantage somewhere and you take this dark gift, that can be good. I can imagine this one and the other one having the 30 extra hit points plus the 25 strength for an hour. Man, you're going to be pretty formidable. Remember, though, every time you use this, the hit points or this 20, 25 for one hour, it recharges after a long rest, you're going to have to roll that charisma save, DC 10, to avoid short-term madness. And I can just imagine the players are just going to, that madness is going to, that DC is going to stack. You're going to hit 15. You're going to be rolling on that long term pretty soon. Okay, <clears throat> let's go up top. Check out this one. I, I'm going to put my hand on this one and make a telepathic link to the dark vestige inside. Here we go. Your eyes deceive you. All is not what it seems. The truth lurks in the shadows, and the truth shall set you free. Accept my dark gift, and you shall see into the darkness. This is a really creepy one, if you ask me. The sky is red, and a liquid red rain falls around you. A human creature in a red robe stands before you. The face is morphed and twisted between beast and man. Its eye sockets are dark and hollow. Its mouth stretches from one side to another. A ring of eyes around its head. The eyes dart in all directions, as if searching. And the creature has its outstretched hand. It holds a book with similar eyes on the cover made of flesh, and the creature's fingers begin to penetrate the book as it's talking to you. Let's take a look at this image. Ah, oh, this is just, this is kind of horrific Lovecraftian in nature, almost kind of Hellraiser-ish, if you ask me. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, it's kind of giving you a hint. I mean, even the image there, the description gives you a little hint. You're gonna gain true seeing on yourself. This is a super powerful spell. Why is this dark gift so amazing? Well, you know, heading into Ravenloft, if you're a dungeon master, you know the secrets, doors, and locations, and all the secrets in there. Having the ability to true see for one hour, for 20, 120 feet, you're going to know a secret hidden passageways, secret doors, all kinds of secret magical things and creatures in the dark. Super powerful. Awesome, awesome. This recharges after a short rest. It only works for one hour. You can only cast it on yourself. There's some downsides. Physically, your eyes are gone. There's only black, hollow eye sockets. You no longer see normally. You, you've lost any sight that you've had. Dim vision, dark vision, any type of vision are gone. 
Instead, you gain blind sight for 30 feet radius. That's it. Anything beyond that is invisible. You immediately become, your mental change, you immediately become suspicious of all those people around you. Now, what's your boon? Your boon at this point here is you're immune to any effect that causes blindness. Obviously, your guys are gone, so you have blind sight. Your bane is you have disadvantage on any intelligent or wisdom check uh, that requires sight. So anything that requires sight, uh, investigation, insight, perception, you're going to re-roll a disadvantage on, except if your true vision is up. So if you have your true vision up, you won't. But uh, otherwise, um, you're going to be rolling disadvantage on those any, any checks that require sight. And you're going to be casting on, the self, on yourself to forget that charisma save to avoid short-term madness here. So some pretty cool ones in here, all of them a little bit different uh, in here. Now we've got our Amber sarcophagi room to the north. Let's go check this out. As soon as you step into this one, the door is open on this one. And this one, as soon as you step in, the door's open. And in the north, you see the the amber uh, sarcophagi is destroyed. There's, there's amber shards on the ground. You can see them. They're glowing here on the ground. Amber shards are glowing on the ground. There's four creatures standing over the amber shards. Uh, each one is picking up an amber shard and kind of staring at it. It's got this one big eye. It's like staring at these amber shards. It turns to stare at you briefly, and then it goes back looking and examining the amber shards, totally ignoring you. Now, if you step in there, if the players are friendly, if they step into the chamber and are friendly towards these creatures, these creatures are, by the way, um, they're cursed wizards. So you remember Strahd slaughtered all the wizards? Well, these are the wizards he cursed. He turned them into these Nothics, right? And so as in life, they're operating, they've lost some of their, their mental capacity, but they're still doing what they can. And they're investigating this destroyed amber uh, sarcophagi. They're looking at the shards. Why are they looking at the shards? They're looking at the shards to see if the dark vestige is still in there or if it's escape and what they're going to communicate to the players when they're in there and they're friendly the players are going to get a telepathic communication from there they're going to hear vampire dark vestige is gone they're going to hear it in different levels of voices and these are the nothics whispering it and telepathically speaking to each other and they're desperately searching hoping that that sliver that dark vestige of the vampire was still in there this is the vampire dark vestige that strahd made a pact with and part of that pact at the end, after he became a vampire immortal, the Dark Vestige asked to be released. Strahd granted that, destroyed the Amber Sarcophagi, releasing the Dark Vestige of the vampire back out onto the world. In return, power, uh, Strahd also got the power to become one with the land, uh, with the mist and everything. Um, this creates a huge opportunity if you want to have the players in the late campaign stage hunt down some Dark vestige that is a vampire maybe it manifests into some kind of vampire god this really leaves i want to leave this open up to you i'd love to hear your ideas and comments down below how this dark vampire vestige maybe turned into some vampire god or something or maybe leaves the party into a whole other you know uh, uh realm of dread or some other eternal plane or something or brings forth a huge new super godlike vampire or something if you want to take the players up to maybe level 18 or 20 leaves it wide open for you now the Gothics, the Nothics, the cursed wizards here won't attack the players. They will only attack the players under two conditions: if the players attack them, or if the player, if the players attempt to destroy one of the other it's amber sarcophagi. So they're still, you know, operating on a limited mental capacity, but they still are trying to protect the amber temple. They're investigating what happened. Maybe the dark vestige is still here. And if you just start to, trying to destroy one of the amber sarcophagi, they will attack you or if you attack them. So otherwise, they'll totally leave you alone. All right, let's go ahead and check out these two. I'm going to go step over to the west. Place my hand up in the amber sarcophagi. Now, if you ignore them, these, these Nothic cursed wizards will just go back investigating the broken shards of amber. They're, they've been picking each piece up, looking to see if there's any remnants or any clues to where this dark vestige of the vampire went. Okay, let's check this one out. Place my hand up there, making my link. Yes, frozen of her. For I am the one who has put forth the golden eyes. Let me grant you the dark 
gift of deadly cold and protect you from its frozen horror. The walls around you, what you're seeing, the walls around you are solid ice. The cold penetrates your bones. There's this massive winged horned demon that seems frozen standing before you. You just heard what he said. Let's take a look at him there. Just standing before you. This is a pretty cool one. This is a pretty powerful one. You're going to get two cool dark gifts. First one is you're going to be able to cast Cone of Cold or Freezing Sphere as an action. This recharges on a 5 and a 6 after a long rest. In addition, in addition to that, you're going to get Frostbite and or sorry, Frostbite or Ray of Frost as an action as well. So you're going to get two dark gifts. This one recharges automatically after a short rest. So you get this, these two cantrips, which is cool. You can use one or the other, recharges after a short rest. Cone of Cold or Freezing, those are Freezing Sphere, pretty powerful. That recharges on a five or six after a long rest. So what happens to you? Your skin becomes cold to the touch and your eyes turn ice blue. Uh, your mental change, you're gonna always complain. It's everything's too hot. You don't like fire, you don't like hot places. You're gonna be complaining about heat all the time. You're completely immune to cold damage. Unfortunately, you're going to be vulnerable to fire damage. That is not good. And remember, and the more dark you, gifts you get, those banes override those boons. So as you stack them, you know, banes override boons. So if you have, you know, resistance uh, or advantage or something to fire damage, now you're vulnerable to it. That, that, that bane is going to override any any boon fire damage or vice versa. If you get this, you go, cool, I'm immune to cold damage. There's another one in here that you're, you're, you're gonna be vulnerable to cold damage. That's the, uh, I think that's the, uh, the one with the hellhounds. And that's gonna wipe out your immunity to cold damage here. So just remember that. But some powerful, powerful spells here. Let's go over the other one. Put my hand up on the uh, Amber sarcophagi. Make my link. Wow, that's spooky. You're surrounded by a dark sky except for a single star. The star grows larger and brighter. Soon the star fills the sky as bright as the sun. The sun turns into a massive eye that fills the dark sky and opens in your mind. In your mind, you hear what you just heard here, what it says here. Here's the text here. So nothing can hide from this. What is it? Well, this is a cool dark gift. It's the scrying spell which is amazing. It's really cool. You know, Strahd's been using scrying. Now you can scry. It recharges on a four, five, and six after a long rest. In addition, you're going to get Arcane Eye as an action, which is a really cool spell. That recharges after a short rest. So this is another, <coughs> excuse me, double dark gift. Physical change. You grow a third eye on your forehead. It's black, and it changes to gold whenever you're using your dark gift, which is kind of cool. Your voice becomes a whisper, and you can no longer speak loudly. Now, I wonder how this is going to infuse with your, with your, if you get the storm one, you know, where you're always speaking loudly and you can no longer whisper. Perhaps would they work opposite of one another? I'd always make everything work to a detriment. So you're going to speak loudly only when you want to whisper, and when you want to whisper, you're going to speak loudly. That's how I, I would have these if you had both those dark gifts. So the, if you had the storm one, we were always speaking loudly. You're going to be speaking loudly when you don't want to. And when you want to whisper and whisper something to somebody, that's when you're going to speak loudly. So they're going to have the, <laughs> they're going to have the polar opposite effects on you. Let's talk about the secret boon and bane that players will discover. They're going to be resistant to psychic damage. That's going to be really, really cool. They're going to be vulnerable to lightning damage, though. Obviously, with that extra eye, any lightning, any, any flash, bright lightning like that is going to actually be you know, vulnerable to that type of damage. Pretty cool, though, dark gift. Okay, we've covered the east, the west here. Let's go ahead and check out. We're going to take a little bit of a break from the dark powers, and we're going to check out the new section DM Andy added, and that's down here at the bottom. This is uh, at the bottom. We're going to be talking about the, uh, this is the locked door down here. We're going to be talking about the central catacombs at the bottom. 
Now, these central catacombs, rules as written, are just empty. There is nothing here. We filled this with some cool stuff, including a secret chamber with the red gem. We're going to be showing all that right here. Let's go ahead and check it out. Now, just like with the other amber doors, if you don't know the password, uh, you can learn the password. If you don't know the password and you destroy the amber doors, this whole area here will blast you with that damage if you destroy the doors. You just double click on it. I just took 21 damage. I'm not doing so well with this damage here. I'm down to 51. I've taken 49 damage so far. If you do use a password, again, Kazan, this, the only way to know this particular password is restoring Kazan's memory. So if we open up the doors and we head down in here, you're gonna, this is what you're going to describe to your players as you head down into this room. This is a really cool area. I like this a lot. Okay, the catacomb is covered in dust and cobwebs. It, it, it must have been sealed for centuries. The doors, that's what it says, must have been sealed for centuries. The candelabras are lit with a magic eternal flame and the catacombs glow in this eerie light. The wall before you, this wall right here, etched on each side is this ancient writing. The temple and the catacomb of the guardians. The elder leaders of the Amber Temple, the selfless wizards that lie here, pledge their lives to protect the world from darkness. Let their spirits rest remain, and remain protected here in remembrance. So all of these, you're going to see these pillars. The walls contain alcoves with ornate carved pillars here. You're going to see them here, right? Ornate carved pillars. Upon each pillar is wrapped carefully is a mummified skeleton decorated in fine gold. The candles with the same magical eternal flames light the mummified skeletons. Below each skeleton is the word guardian, followed by the name of the wizard who served as guardian. So this entire chamber down here are all the wizard guardians over a thousand years that have served as guardians since Kazan was the first one, served as guardians of the Amber Temple. This is their resting place. This is their chamber. The eternal flame is burning there over these mummified skeletons. Now, each one of these wizards here is a mummy uh, that will animate and protect the chamber under the following conditions. So the only way these mummies will rise and attack the player are under these four following conditions. Number one, if you destroy the doors, those doors that we just talked about, if you don't use a password and you blast through them, the mummies will rise and begin to attack. If any of the mummies are desecrated, if you desecrate the bodies, you remember it tells you right here, they pledge your lives to protect from darkness. Let their spirits rest and remain protected. Do not desecrate the mummy bodies, otherwise it will rise and attack you. Number three, if you try to steal any of the gold ornaments from them, the gold on the mummies uh, in their uh, range <clears throat> between about 20 gold to 100 gold per mummy, there's like a gold ornament or something. If you start stealing from the mummy, they will rise and attack you. If you try to break into the walls, because we're going to find the, the red chamber in here with the red gem, if you try to break in through the end of the walls, try to destroy the chamber itself, the mummies will rise to attack you. So those are the four, four ways. Destroy the doors, desecrate the mummies, steal gold from the mummies, or try to break into the end of the walls, the mummies will rise. How does that happen? Well, let's first of all take a look at how many mummies there are. There are a ton of these things. Every one of these things is a mummy. Now, they're all invisible tokens right now. How do we de de determine the attack? If they all raise up, this is a total TPK. That's not how it works. So what happens is you're going to see there's a key I have here. Uh, the key is each one of these things is numbered. And four mummies, up to four mummies, can rise per round. So you're going to, uh, if you, one of those four things happens, you're going to be begin a combat encounter, and this is what you're going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how this works. You're going to roll 1d6. You're going to roll another 1d6. You're going to roll another 1d6 and you're going to roll 1d10. Each 1d6 and 1d10 will tell you which mummy rise based on the key. So the first one is the orange number, number four. One, two, three, four. So this mummy right here, you're going to make that mummy visible. The next one was the green number. Okay, here's one, two, three, four. That's this mummy right here. Rises up. Okay. Uh, the next one was number six, and that is the beige numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the last one right over here. And the last one is the 1D10, the white numbers. That's number three, and that is this mummy right here. So at the beginning, at the, each round, you're going to do that again. So these mummies are going to rise. They're going to begin to attack. You have your combat encounter. These mummies are 
rising up and they're moving. Now, a couple of things about the mummies. Let's just talk about their stat blocks for a bit. They're pretty easy to hit, very low armor class. They do have some hit points, 58. They're not very fast, they're kind of slow. The problem with mummies is they hit you with a rotting fist and they get two attacks. You have to roll a constitution save throw or be cursed with mummy rot. And that mummy rot is nasty. You do not want to get hit with mummy rot. So they're slow, they got low armor class, but that mummy rot punch and them, these things in hordes. So you're gonna have four of them you know, awake coming after you. Okay, the beginning of the next round, you're gonna do it again. Okay, now what happens is, is if you rolled the number twice, like we rolled this four twice, one, two, three, four. So the first one, it's already awake, so you, another one doesn't wake up. The second number was one, so we're gonna go one with the green number. This one now wakes up. The next one here is a four, which we rolled before, right? So this one is already awake, so it's not gonna wake up again. And the next one is a three which we rolled before. So you got, you got, you lucked out on this one. Only one mummy woke up this turn, uh, which is this one here. So each round you're gonna do that. There is a good probability in this particular case, the second round, only one, one out of four mummies awoke. So mummies won't always wake up. And then mummies stop rising and attacking if the players leave the chamber. If you leave the chamber, they will not follow the players out of the chamber. If the players have the red gem in their possessions, the mummies will no longer rise. They will return back to where they're asleep and they will just lay back down. So if you leave, or if you had the red gem, they'll, they'll, they'll lay back down. The other ways to stop the mummies is to wipe them all out. Now, <clears throat> if you remember, Kazan, if you restored his memory, he's not only giving you the password, he's gonna tell you, you need to go to the central catacomb, find the chamber, there's a secret door, and there's a password on the door. There's a phrase on the door, repeat the phrase, and it'll let you in. Now, it's not the phrase that we just saw, Right, the, the phrase here that we just saw, it's not that phrase. They're gonna have to go around and find it. So if the players come around in here and they go in here and they go to the back side of here, they're gonna see on the back side here of this alcove right over here, that each alcove is lit with a magical eternal flame. There's a haunting feeling of dusty catacombs. On the far side of the catacomb, you face a stone wall with a faint writing on it. Some of the letters are worn away. B-E space blank blank S-T a N blank, blank blank A R, blank N O T. The players are gonna to have to figure out what that says. They have to say that saying for the portal door to open. The the saying is be just and fear not. If they say be just and fear not, the portal door will open, all this light will flood out. And this is really cool, I'll show you what happens. <clears throat> if the players step into the portal, they'll automatically be teleported to the inner chamber. This inner chamber has no walls, no doors. I mean, sorry, no doors, no windows. Uh, you feel kind of lightheaded after being teleported in here. In the center of the chamber on the pedestal, there's the large red gem. You can see it right here. The whole room is kind of glowing red. The walls uh, from floor to ceiling are just aligned with skulls. So you can see all these skulls in here. Let me, all these skulls are in here, lining the walls. It's covered in cobwebs. In the center is the red gem. You hear this moaning in here too, from thousands of voices. You're unsure if it's coming from the skulls or what. The red gem is in the middle. Now, Kazan's told you, if you get into the, into the chamber, you say the password, you go through the portal, get in the, red get in the chamber with the red gem. When you grab the red gem, all the players must be touching the red gem to teleport out. If you're not touching the red gem, or standing right next to it on the pedestal, and you go to teleport, you're stuck in here, and the trap is released, and the skeletons come out of the walls and start attacking you. So this is how it works. This is a um, monk's active tile uh, right here. It's got the red gem on it. The players have to be all standing in here. And what happens is you're gonna get a countdown timer. It's 10 seconds. So the players in the room, they can get close to the red gem. They can stack on top of each other. They're all trying to jump and grab that red gem because the red gem and the players are gonna teleport out of this room. You're gonna see this happen. Any players that aren't in one of these four squares here in the middle, are stuck here and then skeletons are gonna come and attack. So let's go ahead and do the teleportation first, show you how this works. So once you sit, you're gonna tell the players, are you uh, taking the red gem? You're gonna go, yeah, and then you're gonna do this. The red gem is missing and the player's gonna 
open up and be in this room here, and then the players will teleport. All the players will teleport that are next to the red gem, touching the red gem. Any players who didn't touch the red gem, they're going to stay in here. So if you're not, if you're in a square away from the red gem, one of these squares far away from the red gem, you're not, you're not on the pedestal, um, you're going to remain here. And as soon as you remain here, what's going to happen is all of these inside here coming out of the walls are these skeletons. And you can see these skeletons kind of emerging out of the wall, coming, crackling, coming out of the wall, and they begin attacking your players. Now, these are normal skeletons. They're super low level. They're super easy. They're a nuisance. The problem is, is your player has no way of getting out of this room unless they bust down the wall. So now you've got these skeletons, uh, AC 13. They're not too strong. You'll be able to get rid of these skeletons pretty much in short order where they come out of the wall, but they're going to freak you out. You're going to be stuck in this room. The only way to get out of this room is either bust the wall or the players have to go all the way back around, come through the portal again, so, you know, if a player comes through the portal again, if they come over here, now they got the red gem, so the mummies aren't attacking them. They come back in here. They'll come in here with the red gem again. Once they're in here with the red gem, they can, on their command, tell anybody, here, touch the red gem with me, and then you guys can teleport. You know, you can just teleport out of here. They'll teleport out right here. There you are. So uh, if you leave anybody behind, it's going to be a, a headache and a nuisance. The good news is if you had the red gem, all of these mummies return back into their, into their sleeping area, go back to sleep, and they leave you alone so you don't have to worry about them anymore. That's, that's how that works out. So you get to red gem. This is really cool. We've got the, the trap. You've got the puzzle door. You've got the trap. We've got monk's active tile triggers going on. You've got the door trap. Let's head north. Uh, and check out two more really cool rooms here. So in the north here, we're going to start off in the room over here, uh, uh, up here. Let me make sure these are turned off. Yeah, they're all turned off. We have the Amber Shrine. Now, this has changed from rules as written. You, you, the doors have been busted down and smashed lying on the floor. Now, the broken furniture, vases, chest, old weapons, bones laid scattered about the floor from a fierce battle from centuries ago. The alcove to the north that's up here is empty, but a purpose built to house something very large. In the north east, uh, west corner, there's a small pile of bones up here on the floor, some skulls on the floor. The room shows signs it was once a place of worship. There are frescoes on the wall that tell the story of the Amber Temple from the construction to its completion, the frescoes are wizards shaping the amber temple, uh, amber sarcophagi and stuff. There are frescoes painted on here. This was a shrine. This was a place of meditation for the wizards to come and meditate. And when uh, the amber vaults uh, were breached, when the amber temple was breached, some of the wizards held up in here and barred the door. And obviously Strahd and some bad guys got through here. There was a nasty fight and the four wizards in here were killed. Now. Uh, a couple of points to note out. The skulls here in the north part uh, of the room are actually from uh, uh, from the, um, I'm going to take my character and just copy them, from the upper floor uh, in here. I'm going to see if I can place my character. There he is. Um, you remember this room up here, which I showed you in the previous video? This is the skull trap room. So if one or more players are in the skull trap room, here I am in, I'm in the skull trap room, you just double click on this, you're going to hear this noise and they're going to fall through the floor, the doors are going to shut, and then the, you're going to fall through the floor, and you're, in, you're going to end up right here, okay? So the, the player's going to end up right here, uh, falling through the floor. That's why those skulls are on the floor. So the, the ceiling opens up, the skulls, and the player falls through and you land in this room. Now, in this room, there are four wizard ghosts. And the wizard ghost won't come to life unless you start messing with the remains, the dead. So if you start messing with the, the skeletons and stuff in here, start touching them, the wizard, the wizard ghosts will come to life. Here they are. And these are normal ghosts. Uh, they have the normal ghost stats. Uh, and just like in life, um, these wizard ghosts who died here are going to come and start defending the shrine against you because they think, you know, you touching their bones and messing with their bones they think you know you're the enemy still, so they're gonna they're gonna materialize and begin to attack you. So there's there's four wizard ghosts in here. 
there's other than that there's nothing of value in here other than you know learning about the shrine now the the uh the alcove in the north this is where the amber uh statue the jackal that's up uh in the hallway that was attacking villainous this is where it once resided here all right so we got uh another door over here let's go ahead and show you that we're going to come over here we have a secret door behind the statue i forgot to mention earlier this secret door leads to the stairwell that takes you up to the library on the second floor. And then over here, we have the final locked, double locked door. Again, if you're out here and you destroy this locked door, you're gonna take damage. It's not gonna be good. Here we go. There we go, I just took 29 damage. I'm not doing so well here, let's see. Yeah, that's another 29 damage. Don't break down these doors. It's just not going to be good. It's not good for your health. This is the treasure room, and this is something you're going to you're going to the players are going to get to learn about a little bit here, which is kind of cool. If you open the door, bust open the doors. The room is made with thick stone blocks, vaulted ceiling, 30 feet above. There's an alcove with a fissure to the north. Okay, there's a stone golem here that may be invisible. Um, and there's piles of treasures that align the east and west walls of the room, and above each treasure pile is the engraved words over each treasure pile. Argenbost, Hopsburg, Abbey, Temple, Druids, and Alms. So over the, on the wall, carved in the wall where the treasure pile is, is these words in there. Now, what is this? The wizards were also secretly the stores and bankers of mass wealth of those who seek peace over the valley. So many of the treasures belong to Argenvoss, who were allies with the wizards and the Fae. The Abbey uh, had left some of their treasure here. The Habsburg dynasty, you remember, Artemis had built the chapel for the Habsburgs at uh, what later became Castle Ravenloft. Uh, the, the Druids' treasures are here as well. So is the, uh, the, the Amber Temple's treasures. And then they also have alms for the poor here, because. Uh, the wizards and the druids, as well as the abbey, would, would try to buy food and, and water and, and help the poor. This is the secret bank, uh, the secret vault to the, the, the treasures uh, within uh, Barovia that nobody knew about. What better place than the, the inside the Amber Temple and, and guarded here in the Amber Temple um, until Strahd breached the vaults. Now, <clears throat> the players that can intend to open the doors, obviously, can suffer that damage there if they open the door, door they had the damage, but the the, the uh, there's amber golem in this room, well, which will automatically become invisible uh, if the uh, if the if the doors are um, breached that way, It'll become uh, invisible. If the if the players enter using the password, you're going to see this giant amber golem. You can see it right here. It's got this kind of weird amber lighting on it. It stands in the room. The Amber Golem will not do anything to the players unless the players take the treasure. Let's talk about the treasures here before we get into the Amber Golem. So on the west side, you have one, two, three piles. The first pile is Argenvoss treasures. It's 8,000 loose gold pieces. It's 40, 20, uh, 50, 50 gold pieces, 40, 40, 20 gems worth 50 gold pieces each. There's um, some half plate armor here. There's the flame tongue greatsword, some great weapons here. There's the Habsburg treasure right here. That's 12,000 gold pieces loose. There's a uh, sword of life stealing. Uh, there's some mithril chain shirt. The next one we have the uh, 4200. This is the Abbey's treasure. There's a ring of protection, uh, amulet of health, and there is also a potion of supreme healing here. So you can see how these treasures kind of align uh, with who they belong to. Obviously, the Abbey has the Amulet of Health and Supreme uh, Potion of Healing. Uh, over here on the east side, you have the Amber Temple itself's treasure, 3,200 gold pieces, a wand of the War Mage plus one, uh, which is pretty cool. The, a robe of useful items is there. The Druid treasure in the middle has a Ring of Animal Influence. That makes sense. Bag of Tricks, a tan bag of tricks, a Staff of Withering, uh, in here, and then you have the gold here, 1,800 gold pieces, 4,700 silver pieces, and 9,600 copper pieces. These were alms used to give to the poor, to give them food, buy them food, uh, give them shelter if they're sick, to help the sick and everything like that. So this is where the treasure was stored. Now the Amber Golem, um, two things about this Amber Golem. 
it's visible if the players open the door with the password, right? It's just stand there. If the players steal any treasure, the island amber golem will attack. Any player that steals the treasure will attack. The amber golem will follow the players out of the room into the main temple area. Be, it will not follow the players beyond the main temple. So the, if the players run into the east or west hallway, amber golem will not follow. If the players run up the stairs, the amber go golem will not follow. It will follow the players out to here. If the players are out of sight, it will return here. Now, if the doors are destroyed, it will stand where the doors were. It will just stand here fully visible and wait because the doors are destroyed. If the doors aren't destroyed, it will reshut the doors, lock the doors, and return to its post. That's what it will do. Uh, and so that's it. You've got these really cool treasure here. This is the big, big treasure room, obviously, uh, in the late game. And it's tied to all these things. But if you take it, you got to deal with this giant column here. Uh, not, not fun. Okay, then we have the feature here. This is where the wall's kind of fallen in. Uh, and leads into the amber vault behind it. So this is the last of the amber vaults in here. This is room 42. Uh, this also, there's a big staircase. This staircase is the staircase from the library. So if you're in the library on the top floor, this, this staircase leads down to the lower amber vault 42. And there's some big changes here. The first thing that you notice in the amber vault 42 Obviously, it's the block marble staircase, some relief sculptures of some gods and kings on the wall. There's the, there's the fissure in the wall in the southeast corner. But there's six crates in here. They're covered in dust. Now, rules is written. These were vampire spawns again. We've already done this once before in the coffin making shop. I just thought, you know what? Let's not have, you know, why would there be vampire spawns in crates here? Right? Instead, these crates contain magical items that the wizards have found over the centuries and they've been putting in here for storage. Except for these aren't treasures you would store in the treasure rooms. These are cursed items. So each one of these things has what appears to be a very expensive magical item, but they are cursed in each crate. So if they open up the first crate, <clears throat> they'll, they'll run an arcana check, DC 15. They'll realize it's powerful magic. They won't know what the magic is. Arcana check will not reveal what the magic is other than it's powerful magic. The only way for them to learn what the magic is and that it's cursed is using the identify spell or they have to attune to it. So the first one, you had this golden plate armor. Um, this plate armor, you're going to decide as the game master is that it is uh, resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing. You'll decide one. Maybe it's resistance to bludgeoning, but it's cursed. The player won't know it until after they put it on that it's vulnerable to the other two. So if it's if it's resistant to bludgeoning, it's vulnerable to piercing and slashing. But it just looks like this beautiful golden plate armor worth a lot of money. There's this black plate armor. looks pretty cool. Um, when you put on the armor, you gain a plus one bonus to your AC. Uh, you can understand and speak abyssal. In addition, the army has these claw gauntlets for some additional strikes. However, wearing this armor, you have disadvantage on attack rolls against vampires. This is the black plate armor of vampires. So when you're attacking a vampire, you're going to be rolling disadvantage on your attacks. Huge curse. Not good at all. You're not going to realize this until you have the identify spell or you put it on and you can't, you can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of the, uh, the, the curse and you can't take it off. You're attuned to it. The gold sword here, we've got this beautiful gold sword. It looks like it's worth a lot. Uh, you have to roll a wisdom save uh, in combat. Uh, if I fail to save, you're going to attack the creature that damaged you until it drops to zero hit points, until you do or it does, or until it can't be reached. So you're just going to go keep on attacking that creature that attacked you until you kill it with your sword. You're going to be focusing using that your sword to constantly kill it until it kills it or kills you. So you, you, you come into this obsessed you know, kind of killing rampage. The gold shield, this is horrible. This is a magnet for a missile weapon. So if a missile's fired at somebody within 10 feet of you, that, that arrow or whatever is being fired at you, that boulder arrow is going to go right towards you. So this shield is like a magnet for, for inbound weapons. Horrible, horrible. The golden necklace with blue stone, you're going to get an advantage on an ability check. But guess what? The next two ability checks are going to be at disadvantage. 
can't get rid of this thing either. This thing is, thing is horrible. Every time you get rid of it, it reappears on your neck. Last but not least, we have the gold great axe. It's the berserker axe. You're going to go berserk. You're going to have to roll a wisdom save after using this thing. If you fail, you're going to make. You're just going to start attacking any creature that's close to, towards you. So each one of these things are cursed. The wizards found these things. They boxed it up. They stuck it in here, uh, thinking that this was probably one of the most protected bolts you have to get. You have to find it in the secret room to get into the library to get down here. Um, it was probably being. They were probably being studied at one time. It's near the library up above. But they're stored here because they're cursed, cursed items. Players will not know this unless they use that identify spell or they put it on. So it's pretty cool instead of vampires popping out of the box. Okay, we have a new, um, uh, uh, since we got rid of the vampire, uh, uh, Dark Vestige, you remember, it's been destroyed. Um, Strahd released it. We've got a new one in here. So let's let's bring our, our, our character in here. Here he is. And... Uh, just did that accidentally. Sorry about that. I, I threw him right. <laughs> I put him in the upper temple because I pushed him through the. See, let's let, let him go back downstairs. There we go. I'll go back downstairs. Here I am, back in the downstairs. There I'm in the amber temple. I'm going to come out. Say hello to say hello to my friend. And now we're down here. We'll go ahead and start with uh, this one over here on the 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 east side. I raise my hand. And I touch the amber sarcophagi and... I live between the world of life and death. I know of those whose time has not yet come. Accept my dark gift and give those who have passed one last bite at the apple of life. Very interesting. He knows whose time has not yet come, accept my dark gift and give those who have passed one last bite at the apple of life. So you're standing in this forest, what you're visioning, you're standing in this forest, blanketed mist, before you is a single gravestone. Roots begin to break the surface uh, of the moist ground and wrap around the gravestone. The ground breaks away and the gravestone rises up and you begin to realize the gravestone is not a gravestone, it's the head of a creature. Let's take a look at this thing. Look at this thing just rising up out of the ground. It gives us a clue. This is a super powerful one. This is the dark gift of resurrection. Wow, this is a really important dark gift, especially in this game, which you probably have players dying. This recharges on the six on a long rest, so you can't use it over and over again. It recharges on the six. You can also cast Death Ward on yourself, which recharges once after a long rest, so you get double double dark gifts really cool the physical change the the receiver of this gift takes on a corpse-like appearance and can be mistaken for the undead each resurrection the appearance grows more corpse-like you speak and think only on death all of the time what is your your boon your you roll advantage on death saves and constitution saves how cool is that however here's the big one each resurrection you do, you permanently lose 3d6 hit points. So if you use your resurrection, you're going to have to roll your Christmas save to see if you go have short-term madness. And then the first time you do it, you as a DM are going to say, you need to roll 3d6. Okay, you go, I rolled a 10. You permanently lose 10 hit points. You'll never get those hit points back. Those are permanently gone because what's happening is you're using part of your life source to resurrect somebody. And so you're slowly dying, and that tells you your physical change. Every time you resurrect, you slowly gr grow more corpse-like. So hugely powerful, you get to resurrect people, but you're slowly dying every time you resurrect somebody after this. So this is a really cool one. Unfortunately, you're slowly losing hit points here. Let's not, ooh, 16, that's bad. You're gonna lose 16 hit points. Permanent hit points, permanent. You're never getting these back. Gotta think about using this one. All right, I'm going to head over to the opposite side. This is where the vampire one was, which I changed. We got a whole new dark gift here. Let's check it out. I raise my hand. I touch the amber sarcophagi and... I need only the moon to light my way as I hunt like the wolf for its prey. Accept my dark gift 
to stalk your enemies and rip their beating hearts from their chests. That's pretty, pretty scary. You're standing in front of a forest is what you see. In the light of a full moon, a creature moves in and out between the trees. You feel like you're being hunted and the creature is stalking you. Let's take a look at this creature here. Look at this thing with the fangs and everything here. This is uh, Malar. Actually, I took some of the ideas from, from uh, some old lore from uh, 3.5. The dark gift is you become a vampire. You, I mean, sorry, not a vampire. The, scratch that. You become a werewolf once per night. If there is a moon, you can decide to use this dark gift and become a werewolf. Now, once you become a werewolf, you're permanently a werewolf until sunrise. You're going to gain 18 strength, 60 feet of dark vision, Plus, you're going to get 2x claw attacks, 1d6 plus strength on each, each one of those. Your physical change, you get to grow, you grow a mane, you grow fangs, your eyes become wolf-like. Your mental change, player becomes aggressive, eager to hunt at night. It becomes more pronounced as the full moon grows. Now, your advantage, boons, you're going to get advantage on smell and hearing skill checks. You're resistant to non-magical and non-silver damage, uh, uh, silver damage Totally cool, totally cool. Your bane, the nights, the nights you do decide to become a werewolf, you use your dark gift, you're only going to gain 50% of your benefits during your long rest. So if you're going to only get 50% of your hit point back, so whatever you're getting back, you're only going to get 50% back. It's not good. On a full moon, the DM controls your character if it's not restrained with civil or manacles. So if it's a full moon, that night you automatically become a werewolf, DM controls your character, unless... You've been shackled with silver, silvered manacles. Again, you're not going to know about these boons or banes until they manifest, but you can turn into a werewolf on command. It lasts again for the whole evening until next sunrise, getting that 18 strength, 60% dark vision, double claw attack, uh, 2x claw attacks, 1d6 plus strength. Pretty cool uh, in there, becoming uh, a werewolf with these simple features here. Last but not least, the most powerful of all the dark gifts. I place my hand on the final amber sarcophagi. Are you ready? Ready. 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 To become the most powerful of all magic users. The journey is a dark one. Is a dark one. Is a dark one. There is no turning back. Turning back. You must die in order to live. To live. To live. No, with all. No, with all. We. What now? I must determine if you are the one. Are the one. Wow. Pretty creepy stuff there. So you're standing, what you're seeing, you're standing in a library. The books rise hundreds of feet up into the darkness. A sin, single hooded figure stands reading a large tomb. It's holding in its hands. It slowly turns towards you. A ghostly bl blue light emanates from the hood where a face should be. And you hear these thoughts in your mind. It's jumbled and confusing. You can barely make it out as you heard. This is the Lich. Let's take a look at the Lich real quickly. Here he is. He's looking at the dark tomb. Looks up at you. Now... Unlike all of the other ones, uh, Dark Gifts, you, mu you have a requirement. You must be able to cast ninth level wizard spells before you get this. So even if you fail the wisdom saves, you're not going to get this Dark Gift. The only way to get this Dark Gift to become a Lich is to be able to cast ninth level wizard spells. And uh, Tenebros, the, the Lich here that's going to give you this, you have to make a pact with him. You have to kill Xanathar or Kazan. You must transfer your soul into his phylactery, and then you must be di die and be reborn and become a lich. You're replacing Kazan Xanthar in order to become a lich, and you become a lich. Just like what Xanthar, uh, I mean, Kazan must have done. They created the phylactery. He transferred his soul. When Stry killed him, he was reborn, and he became a lich through the phylactery. 
Your physical appearance continues to alter over time as you use the flock. You become more undead and darker, more evil. In your mental change, you become obsessed with acquiring knowledge about magic, darkness, and power. Your boon, well, you're a lich, and that is so also your bane. This, again, you probably already know, is probably one of the most powerful creatures in all of Dungeons and Dragons uh, canon is, is a lich. I mean, technically you can't die as long as you've got that flock tree well hidden. Uh, so this is the last dark gift, and that concludes the amazing, the amazing Amber Temple. I really hope you enjoyed this, especially the lower level. A huge shout out to all of the Patreon supporters in sharing your voice acting. Again, I've collected all the voice acting, put them into files, a zip file that you can download to the Patreon members to listen to all of them. Really fun to listen to. I really enjoyed this one. This is an epic, epic location. We've got the red gem there. You have Xanthar, Kazan. You've got the upper floor where you've got the the, uh, the plans to Ravenloft, so many dark gifts and dark powers here. I really hope you like what I put together here. If you did, click that like, that thumbs up button. That lets me know that I'm on the right track, that you're enjoying these guides. Hit subscribe. And if you'd like to participate or want to be on this epic journey with me, you can by becoming a Patreon member. Again, that link's down below, patreon.com forward slash palm king. Until next time, may all your roles be critically successful.